So in this video, we are going to state and prove the fundamental theorem of calculus for the Riemann definition of integration. Now, already there are two parts to the fundamental theorem of calculus, which we can call the first fundamental theorem of calculus and the second fundamental theorem of calculus. And of these two parts, the second part is far more famous than the first part. It's kind of like Newton's laws, where the second one is more famous than the first one, and the laws of thermodynamics, where the second law is far more famous than the first law. And when people just say the fundamental theorem of calculus and don't clarify which part they're talking about, usually they are referring to the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So we'll begin by stating both the first and second parts, and then we'll prove them. So let's start with the first fundamental theorem of calculus, which we can abbreviate to FTC for fundamental theorem of calculus and then 1. So the setup for this then. So we have a function that's a real valued function defined over some closed interval AB. And we're going to assume that the function f is continuous everywhere over that closed interval AB. Now, of course, we've proven in one of the previous videos that any function that's continuous over a closed bounded interval like this is going to be Riemann integrable over that interval. What we can therefore do is define a function which we'll call a of x for area of x and this is going to be the cumulative area function. So it's going to be defined on this interval a, b and it's going to be defined thus. So you integrate from a to x the function f of t dt. So I've drawn a picture to make this clearer. So here's our interval a, b. Here's the original function f of t in blue, shown graphically. And remember, it's continuous everywhere over that interval a, b, so we can draw it without taking our pen off the paper. And then this function a is going to be defined everywhere over the interval a, b. And for a given value x, here's an example value of x, the value it will take on is the integral from a to x of the function f of t. So that's going to be the area from the point a all the way up to the point x underneath our original function's curve f of t. And we know these integrals are all guaranteed to exist. You could use two arguments for that. Either you could use the additivity property to argue that. You know that the function is Riemann integrable over the entire interval a, b. And therefore, given any subinterval from a to x, it's going to be Riemann integrable over that subinterval. Or alternatively, you could just use the continuity property again. If it's continuous over the entire interval a, b, then over any given subinterval a to x, it's also going to be continuous everywhere, and therefore it's going to be Riemann integrable. So this is well defined for all values of x. There's only one that you have to worry about where it's not clear what the answer actually is because we haven't formally defined it yet. And that, hopefully you're screaming at your computers, is the value x is equal to a. For all the other values, it's defined. But what if x is equal to a? We haven't defined what it means to integrate from a to a, where a is the same number. Indeed, it doesn't seem to mean anything by our Riemann definition of integration. So we're going to have to define that as a separate aside. And of course, intuitively, if you don't go forward at all, then the area under the curve is zero. So we're going to define that value to be zero. But it is a separate definition, something that we haven't thus far defined for Riemann integration, and which we'll define now. So I've put this as an aside. We're making this definition. We haven't had cause to define this previously. This is the first occasion where it's become necessary to define this. And really, it's a definition that we're making just to make the notation nice, so that we can write this function a of x just like this. If we didn't define this, then we'd have to define this piecewise and have it set equal to 0 for x is equal to a, and then have it equal to this for x not equal to a and still in this domain. So by defining this, we keep the notation nice and mean that we don't have to define this area function piecewise. So we will define then the integral from a to a of any function f of t dt to be 0. And I hope you agree, it's a perfectly intuitive definition. This is going to have no area, therefore it makes sense for the integral to have value 0. So this thus far is all just the setup for the first fundamental theorem of calculus. What is this theorem then actually? Well, it is that this function a that we have just built is actually differentiable everywhere on your domain, and that the value of its derivative anywhere is the value of the original function at that same point. So a prime of x is equal to f of x.
And the way that people often prefer to write this is that the derivative, and then they put the actual area function in. So the derivative of the integral from a to x of f of t dt is then equal to f of x. So the taking the derivative of the integral undoes the integral, and you get back to the original function. So they kind of cancel each other out. So I've put a box around that. That is the first fundamental theorem of calculus. We'll prove that in just a moment, but before we do, we'll state the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So the second fundamental theorem of calculus, the FTC2. So here's the setup for it. So again, we'll have a function that's real valued and defined over the closed interval AB. And we're going to make the assumption that this function is differentiable everywhere over that interval. Therefore, the derivative exists for all elements on the domain, and therefore we can think of it as being a function over this domain. So f prime is again a real valued function over the closed interval AB. Now, we're going to assume that the derivative function is itself Riemann integrable over that interval AB, and I'm afraid that is a necessary requirement. You might think, surely this follows from this, if this is the derivative of this, surely then this one will be guaranteed to be integrable. It isn't the case. You can come up with very complicated counterexamples where you have functions that are differentiable everywhere over an interval, and yet their derivative is not Riemann integrable over that interval. They are horrific functions. They are variants of the topologist sine curve, but you can construct counterexamples. So this is a necessary additional requirement that the derivative is Riemann integrable over that interval. It does not follow from this. So it is a necessary requirement for the second fundamental theorem of calculus, which we're about to state to hold true. So the second fundamental theorem of calculus then says that if you integrate this Riemann integrable function f prime over the interval a, b, that the value of it is equal to the value of the initial function f, the antiderivative of f prime, evaluated at the upper end point b, subtract the value of the function f evaluated at the lower end point a. And I've put that again in a blue box. This is something you most likely learnt when you were 16 and were first taught integral calculus in school. It is, if people just say the fundamental theorem of calculus, what they mean. So we will now, in the next part, prove both of these, starting with the first.